Hey everybody, Christopher Odd here. Welcome to another episode of The Witcher 2. This is going to be a lore episode, and uh, I will follow up today's lore episode with gameplay. So if you're not into the whole lore thing, totally cool, but uh, I'd encourage you guys to get into it. I don't know why. Some people just don't get it. That's like such a major part of the story. But that's okay. Everyone's their own person. I'm not judging. So there's a couple books we need to go through and then some journal entries. It's definitely, well, I don't think it's going to be as long as the previous one. But I feel like we're making really good progress towards the end of chapter two. And we got most of our books from one individual. That I just bought everything he had. And then we picked up a couple of things along the way. Uh, but most of them I think are going to be short based on the monsters and uh, that kind of stuff. So the first book is Beings of the Elemental... Of the element of earth. So, uh, the earth elemental is the younger brother of the legendary Tao, the genie capable of creating earthquakes and flattening mountains. Younger means less powerful, but also more mischievous, felling trees, toppling the walls of buildings, and crushing people into a pulp <laughs> number among this creature's pranks. Of course, it performs only those its master wishes it to. All right, cool. Brook's Eye, now we've opened this, but uh, the Brook's Eye is a higher vampire that is a post-conjunction creature, an intruder in our world. She assumes the form of a beautiful woman, then turns terrifying when she grows hungry and attacks. As befits a vampire, the Bruxa drinks blood. The victim of a Bruxa is often both her lover and her chief source of sustenance. Interesting, actually. Uh, gargoyles. Theorists of magic still argue about how gargoyles should be classified. This author favors the school which claims they are a type of golem. For gargoyles are nothing more than fancy sculptures brought to life by magic and ordered to perform menial duties. They can complete only the most rudimentary of tasks, so they are often found guarding a territory even if their creator turned to dust long ago. He who seeks to deactivate the creatures permanently must first locate the place from which they are controlled. Once there, he extinguish the magic runes that control the construct's will. Okay. Harpy is my favorite monster. There are many species of harpy, and all are kleptomaniacs, though some steal dreams instead of trinkets. They especially like dreams laden with strong emotions, such as nightmares that recur every night. The victims lose their dreams, which can actually be a blessing where nightmares are concerned, and the harpies encase them in crystals, creating items that strongly radiate magic. Mages desire the dreams these creatures steal. They are even known to breed harpies on perches with a view towards filching their booty at daybreak. Yet it is rare for a dream or nightmare to be powerful enough or to come from a powerful enough creature to satisfy the desires of a mage. He who would destroy a harpy's nest perched atop a rocky ledge must set a special glistening explosive trap. When the harpy snatches its loot, the charge is detonated, and anything that survives the explosion is dealt with by gravity, the eternal flow, <laughs> the eternal foe of all avian creatures. That's interesting. How to kill a bulvor. These are messy. The bulvor can be compared to a heap of muscles contained within a flexible yet durable hide. It has the head of a buffalo, yet its mouth is filled with sharp teeth, perfectly suited to rending flesh. Bulvors are post-conjunction beasts. Visible marks of chaos include the creature's horns and the vestigial, largely immovable limbs that cover its body. Of trolls and trolling. According to legend, trolls were born of the earth and their body is made of rock. They fear and despise sunlight, which kills them by turning them into inanimate stone, so they only prowl at night. So much for legends. What is the reality? Well... As always, the truth is far more mundane. Trolls are living creatures like you and me, and they prefer day to night. For they are so clumsy, they stumble over stones in the dark, spilling the vodka they cherish so much. Their skin is indeed hard as stone, but beneath it there are muscles and a heart that pumps blood. Given that they bleed, they can be killed. And that's a little hint to obviously use uh, bleeding as a critical effect on them. Slaves of the Curse, this is about drogs. They are commanders, and drogers are their wraith soldiers. A drog called calls drogers into existence on battlefields or in cemeteries by the sheer force of his will. Like the drog himself, which is that big beast that we slew earlier. These minions arise from damned souls trapped within shells formed of the remnants of arms, armor, war machines, and corpses that were torn apart by scavengers. The conjunction of... The Spheres. There are scores of learned works, dissertations, and treatises about this magical cataclysm 
from about 1500 years ago. Because of this event, creatures never seen before entered our world and still do not have their own ecological niche here. Among others, graveyards and ghouls are relics of the permeation of the spheres, though elven tradition has it that we humans are also newcomers from that time. The sorcerers claim that that time humanity received both the wondrous gift and the terrible curse that they consider magic to be at that time. The Dun Banner. Dun Banner rose to fame during the last wars with Nilfgaard. A Kedweni Light Cavalry Regiment. Initially, it patrolled the area around Banglean, or Blank. Banglean, perhaps. Called to the front, it proved its mettle during the incursion into Upper Edern, but it was the chronicles of the Battle of Brenna who made the unit famous. Because history likes to repeat itself, Several, several years later, the Dun Banner once again led Henselt's foray into Edern. This time it suffered a crushing defeat at the hands of an ostensible ally, no less the sorceress Sabrina Glevisig. Decimated beyond resurrection, the unit was never reformed and its characteristic cloaks and beaver skin caps, which once bred terror in the hearts of Kedwin's foes, became a thing of the past. Though they remain identifying marks by which the unit's few surviving former members recognize one another. And we do have that beaver, that beaver skin cap still, because I never ended up setting it uh, in the area where he asked me to. Whoops. The Nilfgaardian Empire. The Empire of Nilfgaard is the largest state of the known world, its rule extending over a, more than a dozen provinces. It has conquered all the realms south of the Amal Mountains and united them under one crown. Black imperial standards adorn with the Golden Sun flutter over buildings and outposts from the Yaruga River in the north to Vic Vicovaro in the south and the mountain massif of Tir Toker in the east. The Empire's mighty armies lie in wait, ready to bring death at their ruler's command or to die eagerly in his name. The Black One's continued march northward uh, was la oh, the Black One's continued march northward was last stopped several years ago through the united effort of the northern kingdoms and the sacrifice of much blood at Brenna. Yet peering across the Yuruga on a bright day, one can still see their dark cloaks and the sun glancing off the points of their lances. The Realms of the Nordlings. This realm is bordered by Kedwin to the north, Redania to the northwest, Temeria, and the massif of the Mahakam Mountains to the west, and Lyria to the south. The Blue Mountains line its eastern frontier. Edern's coat of arms is a golden red chevron on a black field, and its capital is Vengerberg. Not long ago, the country nearly disappeared when Nilfgaard occupied its southern territories and its northern neighbor and supposed ally, Kedwin, treacherously annexed Upper Edern. Though the invaders were defeated and Kedwin withdrew from Edern's northern lands, the kingdom's fate was still, still hangs by a thread. The country has been ravaged by peasant revolts and central government seems ever unsteady. A hog named Henselt. <laughs> uh, this is so we've read this before, but it's funny, so I'm going to do it again. This is the pamphlet that Dandelion created. Uh, yet Henselt courts the imperial envoy like a cheap whore who has singled out a burger with a full pouch at the brothel. Keep in mind that a whore can let anyone she wishes plow her. Her arse, her choice. The king owes us more. His arse belongs to all of us, and its name is Kedwin. Dare we allow a Nilfgaardian prick to plow our country? As my friend who is a witcher says, if that's what the world needs to be saved, perhaps it would be better that it perish. That's awesome. And good art. Malgut's notes is something that I cannot read. Uh, the visionary's notes we've actually read, so I'm going to not cover those. So, uh, letter of supplication to Saint Sabrina. Saint Sabrina, I humbly beg you to hear my supplication. Grant me, O fair lady, your blessings and protection. Deem me to s deem or deign to save me from the snares of my enemies and from all dangers. Okay, what else is there? Um, Deathmold's grimoire. We've looked at. It was just that kind of pentagrammy type thing. Soldier's notes to visionary. Uh, we've read that as well. The Thanid Cup. The coup at Thanid Island was one of the most significant events in history. In that memorable, 
memorable day during a sorcerer's summit, the magicians loyal to the Northern Kingdoms intended to arrest those of their brotherhood that conspired with Nilfgaard. The conspirators, on the other hand, prepared a coup against the conference. They secretly led Skoitel and Nilfgaardian agents on Thanid. Many members of both factions died in the bloody battle that raged in the palace chambers, yet in the end, the traitors had to flee for their lives. This event greatly reduced the mage's confidence, and many fell out of favor of the kings they served until then. The Conclave of Mages. Uh, the Conclave was, next to the Supreme Council of Sorcerers, one of the two main bodies ruling the magicians. The most powerful sorcerers of their time sat on it. One of its duties was regulating the standards and rules of using magic. The ban on necromancy was one of its edicts. Before the Thanid Rebellion, a large part of the Conclave conspired with Nilfgaard. During those events, most of its members died, the sole survivor being Francesca Findebear. After the coup, the Conclave was not reactivated, thus many mages did not respect the restrictions it had created. Obviously, Death Mole doesn't respect those restrictions. Uh, this is about years of uh, research into the Wild Hunt. So we've read this, but I'm going to read it again. I spent all my life researching the Wild Hunt, and without false modesty, I can say I read everything that exists on the subject. Furthermore, I saw the Wraith gallopade with my own th eyes three times. I managed to perform quick measurements on the second and third sighting, and acutely examine the observational material in detail. Based on my knowledge and experience, I came to a crushing conclusion. I am certain that there is a terrifying alien force behind the hunt. I mine... A mind completely mad, yet still a mind, not pure chaos. I firmly note that the Wraith Riders are someone's or something's emissaries, and their deeds are governed by a plan of some kind. The war is for Upper Edern, the part of Edern that lies between the Pontar and the uh, Diffin, Diphne, Diphne? Rivers is called Lormark or Upper Edern, depending on the interested party's political persuasion. These lands have been disputed for ages, with Kedwin laying claim to them as well. During the last war with Nilfgaard, Edern found itself in deep trouble, fighting an uneven battle to repel the onslaught of the Black Ones in the south. Sensing that its southern neighbor would ultimately bow to the invaders, Kedwin, Edern's ostensible ally in that conflict, sent its armies into Lormark, annexing the region. Several days later, Margrave Manfeld of Ard Karag and Marshal Menno Corhorn, commander-in-chief of the Nilfgaardian army, greeted each other on a bridge spanning the Diffney River. They shook hands over the bleeding, tortured corpse of the Kingdom of Edern, sealing a criminal partitioning of plundered lands. And even though Kedwin restored Lormark to Edern after the war, its taking of the territory with Nilfgaardian support was one of the most disgraceful acts in history. A poem about the wild hunt. Again, we've covered this, but I'm going through it. Tracing an ever wider spiral, the hunt circles the world of mortals. Everything decays in the centrifugal vortex. Uh, pure anarchy rages over the world. The winds of war swell on blood, flooding the rights of ancient innocence. The best lose all hope and the worst re revel in fervent and fitful power. Looking glass images without heart or mind haunt the worlds in the name of those who have preserved blood from blood and feed on unrestrained lust. Ambassador Schillard fits Osterlin's first letter to the Emperor in his Imperial Majesty, or to his Imperial Majesty. The Emperor of Nilfgaard, Emir Var Emrys, a private, private and confidential. Your Imperial Majesty, I hasten to report that the sorcerer Van Hemer has indeed proven right for the role assigned to him. He keeps his apprentice Cynthia on a short leash and displays nothing approaching excessive ambition. I believe him to be of unquestionable loyalty, and his abilities are more than adequate to serve your Imperial Majesty's objectives. The summit will be the final test. We will see how he behaves there, and if he proves more capable of resisting temptation than his female colleagues did. Please convey my kindest regards to your consort. Now, this is uh, Sarit's notes, and I thought this was about somebody else, but actually it's about me. So, um... He seems different, but in reality is so similar. Our paths have been the same. We survived the trials, endured the same training, and have slain so many monsters that we no longer keep count. So many men also. The difference is in the details. When I see him moving in combat, I want to laugh, but I also see that he's just as effective, if not more so. There is, however, one critical difference I cannot describe adequately. He has a goal. He is committed to something. He doesn't wander the world as if blown about by the wind. I feel he feels... I believe he feels emotions at a level I cannot attain. 
yet those emotions are not typically human. Is it an illness of some kind? I think he teeters on the brink of instinct and emotion, and that he uses up a lot of energy to maintain his mental health. I hope I get a chance to know him better and learn from him. Nothing specific, just life. Uh, this is the journal from the Ayla Tarn, which we just found on the boat. Uh, to the Supreme Council of Mages, the research and exploration conducted in Loch Muin has produced surprisingly good results. Our discoveries went well beyond simple valuables and historic items. Namely, we unearthed a relic that belonged to a member of the first conclave. The fools accompanying me on this journey have no notion of the significance of this find. The item is simply too important to land in a dark short storeroom of the Faculty of History. As a spiritual successor of the first mages, I hereby claim ownership of it, in my own name as well as yours. The find is bound to cause a fuss, thus I request your support in the appropriate lobbying at Foltest Court, Oswin. Okay. So now there's a couple of things uh, that we need to review uh, in our journal. So let's do that. Uh, specifically, a couple of quests that we should probably close off here. Uh, Mystic River. So Geralt found the notes of the treasonous sorcerer in the wreck of the Ayla Tarn which the local trolls had dragged onto dry land to use as their love nest. The mage wanted to get his hands on the archaeological expedition's findings, uh, which were being transported downriver on the Ayla Tarn in the Petra Shili. Or, or Sili? I guess it would probably... I don't know. Petra Sili. There was a battle in the first ship. The renegade aboard it was sunk. The witcher found smithing materials from the time of the Vrans along with the notes. He could put them to immediate use, but the notes also mentioned a treasure hidden beneath Loch Muin that when combined with these materials would produce Vran armor. Oh, Okay, so that armor, like, uh, fragment or whatever that I picked up, I should save that until I find, until I can go down to Loch Muin underneath and find a treasure there, and then I can make armor out of it. That's pretty cool. Faith symbolized uh, the Witcher persistently, tra persistently tracked the <laughs> tracked the assassins of kings and did all he could in the case. He held tents out twice, so he earned the monarch's gratitude. The king finally gave up his medallion, and Geralt acquired the symbol of faith. And hatred symbolized this is a we already had uh, seen this. I'm gonna read this because it's kind of funny. Uh, sending Zoltan out on an espionage mission is like asking a bear to knit you a sweater. Nothing good is likely to come of either. Dwarves are just ill disposed to doing things discreetly. The plan was to get the sword to get the sword secretly proved a miserable failure. At the meeting place, Geralt found not only Zoltan, but also Saskia. The Dragon Slayer had squeezed the dwarf for information and plucked it from him one word after another. She then expressed a desire to meet the Witcher personally. Luckily, Saskia proved to be a wise and compassionate person. After a courteous discussion, the honorable, uh, she honorably handed Geralt the sword. Okay, cool. So that's everything in there. Uh, new locations, probably a few. So here's just the battlefield. The site was not much to behold, even on a sunny day. Yet it was here that several years earlier, a bloody battle had ended in a magical cataclysm. Rocky gullies opened into a plain, scarred with furrows and craters dug by trebuchet missiles and magical explosions detonated by the sorceress Serena Glevisig. Tall reddish grass covered part of the flatland, the rusting armor and bleached bones of the fallen nestled among it. Once the curse was activated, however, a ghastly mist engulfed a section of the battlefield. Within it stretched a world seemingly pulled from a nightmare, a world in which ghosts of the fallen endlessly reenacted the battle that had claimed their lives. Once the Witcher lifted the curse, the mist dissipated and the specters of the fallen vanished into the beyond. Kidweni Camp. The Kidweni military camp greeted us from afar with the cacophony of sounds typical of such encampments. Officers' commands and sentry shouts mixed with the growling of platoon leaders and lightning enlisted men as to their mother's professions and why these ladies charged so little for their services. <laughs> Veterans cursed, recruits sniveled, whores giggled, horses neighs, and dogs barked. The din was accompanied by a jumble of smells. The stench of several thousand men who consider guard duty in the rain to be an adequate bath cannot be mistaken for any other, and this blended with the sense of boiling cabbage, foot wraps, and stables. Compared to the noxious odor, the wind carried from the camp latrines on sunny days, the smell of the Karen's lairs seemed like that of a flowering meadow. That is disgusting. <laughs> you can almost, like, taste it. It's so gnarly. Camp followers encampment. The inevitable hodgepodge of camp followers had settled in just beyond the palisade of Henselt's military camp. 
The area was home to all manner of rabble such as craftsmen, prostitutes, traders, thieves, and vagabonds. In other words, all those needed to keep an army on its feet. Vernon Roach was directed to settle with his soldiers among the camp followers. This instruction from the Kedwenis was meant as a jab at the Temerians, but the Blue Stripes honestly preferred the company of scoundrels to that of warriors bearing the unicorn on their chests. Hunt on the, or the hut on the cliff. The abandoned hut on the cliff has had witnessed a monstrous event. The entire family inhabiting the home had died a bloody death in unclear circumstances. There were many derelict settlements and farms in the area around Vergen. Some had survived in better shape than others. Forest ravines. Wooded gullies scarred the land between Vergen and King Henselt's camp. Innumerable monsters, including trolls, inhabited these ravines, so they were not exactly ideal places to picnic but a traveler following the gullies would be relatively hidden from prying eyes, a fact which, as you will learn, Geralt took full advantage of. Okay. Now, as for the characters... Let's see here. Okay, so the visionary. Uh, During my travels, I've seen many prophets, preachers of divine truth, who frothed in gibbered foretellings about the end of the world, depravity of women, lechery of kings, and rising taxes. The visionary extolled the martyrdom and sanctity of Sabrina Glevesig, and these ideas had become the foundations of a local cult. Supposedly, the sorceress's favor made him invulnerable and safe. However, there was no way to decipher how much truth lay in his tales. One theory to explain his invulnerability ascribed warding qualities to the sui used to make his candles. Indeed, their scent would keep even ghouls at bay. There was a relatively simple explanation for his ardent faith. The visionary was none other than Yahon, the soldier who had ended the sorceress's suffering by piercing her with a spear during the execution. That event had changed his life and guided him down the path to prophethood. Okay, Elton. <laughs> this is the, uh, Elton. Uh, this inhabitant of a hut near the quarry had one of the oddest jobs I've ever heard of. Namely, Elton serves as a purchasing agent for a collector of harpy feathers. Offering the Witcher generous sums of pinions, or for pinions and retresses picked from the carcasses of harpies. As it turned out, Elton was not buying feathers for a collector, but for himself. With the sack full of plumage Geralt supplied, he finally fulfilled his dream of transforming himself from an ugly duckling into a swan. Or more precisely, a queen harpy. <laughs> uh, that's actually really funny. Skalen Burden. Cecil's nephew, the young Skalen Burden had been taken in by the Alderman after the lad's parents perished in one of the non-human massacres that occurred in Edern. As friendly, hardworking, and efficient as his uncle, Scallon took it upon himself to act as Vergen's official representative in his uncle's absence, providing all newcomers to the town with any information or assistance they needed. Um, what else? We have the Kingslayer. We've read most of this. Um, the magic sent Geralt a vision and gave us another bit of information. Letho had been in the area earlier and had ordered his accomplices to assassinate King Hensel. The Kingslayers had been working with Sheila de Tansarville, but just as with Yorveth, their paths had diverged. Whatever finale would conclude the story, Letho claimed it would take place in Loch Muin. Zoltan. Um, though it was not exactly Zoltan's cup of tea to visit Hensel's camp, a place where non-humans were at best treated with mistrust and disdain, he decided to go with us, yet he felt rotten, knowing nearby his kin were preparing to repel the same Kedweni we were visiting. Everyone's patience has its limits, uh, thus it should not be surprising that he eagerly took the chance to leave Henselt's camp and head to Vergen. She led to Tansarville. Ah, uh, yes. Um, the posthumous examination of the would-be assassin's memories revealed something shocking. Sheila had been directly involved in at least one ruler's death. Things were getting increasingly complicated. Unfortunately, the sorceress had already managed to flee the camp. The interests of the sorceress and the assassins were no longer the same. It appears that Detanserville began to, cut to cover her tracks, beginning with the elimination of her former allies. Right, because she had taken out uh, the second assassin that we found in the camp. And uh, now I guess she's going after Letho. Uh, Sarah, we've read this first part. Um, the vision of Ox's memory lifted the veil of secrecy surrounding the other Kingslayer. Sarah has also been acting on Letho's orders, and all three had been behind the deaths of Foltest and Demavend, as well as the attempt on Hensel. Sarah could certainly answer more questions, and Geralt knew where to find him. Unfortunately, Sheila found the assassin first. With his dying words, however, he confirmed 
to Tanserville's complicity in their conspiracy, as well as the fact that he knew Geralt. Sarah died before saying anything more, leaving the mystery unsolved. Ox, the other one. When he first heard Ox's name, the Witcher had no idea who he was. Ha! Huh. Did he... He did not have the slightest inkling of the role this individual would play in our story. The assassin's identity was revealed only after his death. The accomplice of Letho and Serret fell at Geralt's hand, but his memories provided very important information. The Kingslayer is responsible for the deaths of Foltes and Demavend, as well as the attempt on Hanselt, had played a game of their own in which both Sheila and Yorvith had been pawns. Furthermore, it seemed that they and Geralt shared a common past. Henselt. Um, let's see here. Thanks to the Witcher, the curse plaguing Henselt was lifted. The king breathed a sigh of relief and returned to realizing his plans with redoubled energy. Apart from invading Edern, these probably included killing Stennis, hanging, and Stennis is the one who's with uh, Saskia, hanging all non humans and plowing Saskia, not necessarily in that order. Henselt revealed the entirety of his rotten character when he had Roach's men murdered and personally defiled the Vess. In this way, he gained a mortal enemy in the form of Vernon Roach. Deathmold. All said and done, Deathmold was certainly a talented sorcerer. It was only his power that brought the king and his retinue safely through and out of the mist of wraiths. The sorcerer believed that the ends justified the means and that uh, and thought nothing of the ethical ban on necromancy. The sorcerer was Henselt's creature in full, a lackey who served his master in any way possible. Uh, this included tracking real and imagined spies and thwarting conspiracies on the monarch's life. He was also among those chiefly responsible for the deaths of Vernon's men, those grisly demise, whose grisly demise Henselt himself had ordered. Ooh. Saskia. News had already reached of the heroic Saskia, the woman who held Kedwin's armies at bay. At the time, however, it all seemed like little more than exaggerated rumors. And uh, sorry, I'm only skipping this part because I think we've read this already. Um, yeah, we have read this. Uh, as with any true hero, there were many incredible tales about Saskia. Some claim she was invulnerable to fire and thus survived that that terrible battle when Sabrina had rained the very flames of hell down upon the combatants. The girl was also famous for killing a dragon. One would be hard pressed to find better material for a local hero. Prince Stennis. After King Demovin's death, Prince Stennis became heir to the Adernian throne, at least in name. However, pride and chilly disposition rarely win the love of one's subjects, and that was very much Stennis's problem. His youth did not strengthen his, his claim either. Though no one openly questioned the prince's claim to the throne, uh, to the crown, Stannis did not have enough support to actually have it placed upon his head. Given this situation, sitting out important events uh, would have been political suicide. The war for the Pontar Valley gave him the ideal chance to bolster his position by demonstrating what a good ruler he would make. History has shown time and time again that when a realm is in chaos, deeds rather than words grant one legitimacy in the eyes of one's subjects. Stennis greatly desired to prove himself the equal or superior of the Virgin of Eddard. He had strong support from the nobility, yet the common folk had few reasons to sympathize with him. Yarpen Zagrin. This is the guy with the comb over. Comb over. Our, friend with, uh, our friendship with Yarpen Zagrin stretches back a long time. It began during the famed hunt for the Golden Dragon, which, was not only, which not only was caught, but also beat up its hunters. <laughs> Those events were later described in one of my ballads, and anyone interested in the story should read it. Zagrin, like most of his kin, is characterized not only by his love of gold, but also by his body sense of humor, sober outlook, pragmatism, and loyalty to his friends. Geralt mentioned that he later met Yarpin and his lads in the Majesty's Secret Service, the Majesty in question being Henselt of Kedwin, uh, for whom they were escorting a secret cargo. Though their own situation was not cheerful at all, they nevertheless aided the Witcher, easily proving that a dwarf won't abandon a friend in need. And Sabrina Glevisig. So, um, I'm going to go through this whole one. The sorceress Sabrina Glevisig was from Ard Kareg, the capital of Kedwin, and had been King Hensel's advisor. The reader, however, should not be deceived by that term. This true daughter of the Kedwini wilderness was famous for her determination and temperament. There was no exaggeration to the rumors that on many occasions she would interrupt the king, thumping her fists on the table and yelling that he should shut up and listen. 
and the king would indeed shut up and listen. Sabrina Glevesig's predatory nature was paired with an unequally predatory beauty, which she emphasized through appropriately chosen attire. Add to that the power she commanded as a sorceress, and should be clear to what she owed her strong position not only in Kedwin, but also beyond its borders. This position could not protect her from the king's wrath, however, and when she failed Hansel one time too many, the sorceress ended up at the stake where her life ended. Sabrina cast a curse on the monarch, and the battle filled with her dying death, dying breath. Many years later, we were to feel the effects of this maldiction. Sabrina had become a martyr in the eyes of some soldiers, thus possibly achieving greater esteem in death than she had enjoyed in life. It cost Geralt a great deal of sweat, but he finally found a solution to the problem. Sabrina's spirit finally found solace, and the curse she had placed on Henselt was lifted. Okay. A um, couple of things about the Bulvor, or a couple of things about uh, some uh, monsters. The Bulvor can be compared to a heap of muscles constrained. Oh, these are all basically exactly the same as the books. Uh, basically the same description, but the pictures are pretty cool. Uh, crafting, not a big deal. Tutorial, alchemy, and glossary. So, let's see. The good book. Once a disciple of his said to the prophet Lebiota, Teach me, master, how should I proceed? My neighbor's desires my favorite dog. Should I give him my dog? Uh, my heart shall break from grief. Yet, should I deny him the dog, I shall be unhappy, for I shall harm my neighbor with my refusal. What do I do? Keep the dog. Uh, the conjunction of spheres. There are scores of learned works, dissertation, treatises about the magical cataclysm. Yeah, so these are all... I don't know what the difference between the glossary is. Um, oh, this goes a little bit more in detail about some of these areas. Okay, so I'll read you... I'll, I'll go through these. So, Kedwin... Uh, the formidable ranges of the Blue, Kestrel, and Fiery Mountains define the eastern and western boundaries of the densely forested, cold, and harsh domain of Kedwin, whose coat of arms is a black unicorn rearing on a golden field. The realm's capital at Ard Kareg was the seat of power of King Henselt, a man known for having a violent temper and pursuing radical policies towards non-humans. The latter could be attributed to the fact that Scoia'tael units consistently caused great injury to the wooded land and its inhabitants, launching many brutal guerrilla attacks. The local human populace responded with massacres perpetrated on the assimilated elves and dwarves inhabiting the country's cities. And so hatred burned on and blood bred blood. Those who called for peace were accused of treason and often died at the hands of their kinfolk. Furthermore, Kedwin was involved in an age-old feud with neighboring Edern over the territory of Lormark, and that conflict cast a, cast a pall over relations between the two countries. As you will clearly see, its echoes rang out in this story as well. Nilfgaard. The Empire of Nilfgaard is the largest state in the known world, its rule extending over uh, more than a dozen provinces. It has conquered all the realms south of the Amal Mountains and united them under one crown. Black Imperial standards adorned with the golden sun flutter over buildings and outposts from the Yairuga River in the north to Vicovaro in the south and the mountain massif of Tir Toker in the east. The Empire's mighty armies lie in wait, ready to bring death at their ruler's command or to die eagerly in his name. The Black One's continued march northward was last stopped several years ago, though the united effort, or through the united effort of the Northern Kingdoms and the sacrifice of much blood at Brenna. Yet, peering across the Aruga on a bright day, one can still see their dark cloaks and the sun glancing off the points of their lances. So some of this is a little bit repeated, but... Loremark or Upper Edern. The part of Edern that lies between the Pontar and the Daphne River is called Loremark or Upper... Yeah, this one's exactly the same. Maybe these all have been the same, I can't remember. Yeah, th these ones are the same. Than is the same. Conclave, the same. Okay, those might have been repeated, but... It's all good. That's everything. So uh, that's the lore section for chapter two. Anything going forward, even in chapter three, um, anything that I find, I'm going to read as it happens. And that's definitely going to be my plan for uh, when I play The Witcher 3 next year. <sighs> I can't wait. Uh, is to read things as they come. The buildup, uh, like buying all the books and everything and then waiting is nice, but... I feel it's easier to keep up and it's 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 easier to comprehend once you're like in the moment because typically the books and the, the things that are 
obviously being added to your journal are very relevant to uh, the specific time that you get them. So anyways, thanks you guys for watching. What's the code going to be? I like to do these lore things and then have a code at the end to see if people actually watched or listened. Let's see. The code can be... Uh, what do I want it to be? Oh! We've already read this anyways. Uh, the poem can be... The Song of the Hunt. Eh? Here it is. The Song of the Hunt. I like it. Thanks guys a lot. Thanks guys a lot. Thanks a lot guys and girls. We'll see you next time. And I uh, hope you enjoyed. Bye.